This video is concerned with carbon dating. Carbon dating has become a generic term. How do we know how old something is? Carbon dating. By the end of this video, I hope that you will understand that carbon dating, or more accurately, radiocarbon dating, is much more specific than that. Radiocarbon dating is applicable in only certain specific circumstances and is thus limited to dating certain materials and only those of a certain age. Let me start with a little history which I hope you will find interesting. Carbon has been known by us naked apes for millennia. Coal, burnt offerings to the gods, charcoal, graphite, burnt toast, diamonds. These are all allotropes of carbon, an allotrope being simply a different arrangement of the atoms. Carbon occurs naturally on Earth in three forms. Carbon-14 has eight neutrons and accounts for approximately one part per trillion of the naturally occurring carbon on the Earth. Carbon-14 is radioactive and unstable. It has a half-life of 5,730 plus or minus 40 years, meaning that after this time, half a sample of carbon-14 will have decayed. It decays into nitrogen-14. This is the stable nitrogen that accounts for approximately 99.634% of the nitrogen in the air we breathe. And of course, all living things on the earth, animal and vegetable, are carbon-based. This brings us to Martin Kamen. In the late 1930s, Kamen was investigating the chemical reactions involved in photosynthesis. To do this, he was using carbon-11, another radioactive isotope of carbon, as a tracer. Unfortunately, carbon-11 has a half-life of just 20.38 minutes, meaning that within a couple of hours, so much of it had decayed that it was no longer traceable. Kamen therefore looked for another radioactive isotope of carbon with a longer half-life, and he knew of the theory that carbon-14 might be produced in the Earth's atmosphere. He used a cyclotron, a small particle accelerator, to bombard carbon with high energy, and he got his carbon-14 in 1940. Enter stage left, Willard Libby. Libby knew about Kamen's creation of carbon-14 in the lab, and he knew of the theory that carbon-14 might be produced in the Earth's atmosphere as a result of the bombardment of nitrogen atoms by cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are high-energy particles hitting the Earth's atmosphere from outer space. It had been hypothesized that nitrogen, making up 78% of the atmosphere, would be the element in the atmosphere most affected by cosmic rays. Libby hypothesized that this carbon-14 would quickly combine with oxygen to form CO2, carbon dioxide, that it would then be taken up by plants during photosynthesis, and because every animal eats plants, or other animals which eat plants, every living thing on Earth should contain an even proportion of carbon-14. Libby published his thoughts in the journal Physical Review in 1946. Once a living organism dies, he hypothesized, it no longer ingests atmospheric carbon-14. Thus, the proportion of carbon-14 in a dead carbon-based sample is directly related to how long it has been dead, because the amount of carbon-14 will reduce by a half every 5,730 plus or minus 40 years. Every living organism, including you, contains around 60 billion carbon-14 atoms for every gram of carbon and of those 60 billion carbon atoms, about 14 decay every minute. All Libby had to do was count them. Here Jim Arnold enters Libby's lab and our story. Arnold developed the instruments to detect very small amounts of radioactivity and to exclude extraneous radioactive noise. In 1948 Libby was ready to carry out a live test on a dead sample. He tested the procedure on Egyptian artifacts from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, specifically a piece of acacia wood from the tomb of the Egyptian pharaoh Djoser. The archaeological evidence told them that Djoser's tomb was around 4,650 years old. They calculated that at this age they should record 7.15 radioactive decays per gram of carbon per minute. After repeated tests, they recorded an average of 7.04 decays per minute with an uncertainty of 0.2 decays, or 2.8%. They published in Science in 1949. By the end of 1949, they had published in Science again, with details of the accurate radiocarbon dating of six samples of known age. In that article, they included the curve of knowns. For each of the calculated dates, they included error bars. And on the same graph, they plotted Ernest Rutherford's law of radioactive decay values for carbon-14. 
It's important to note that the Rutherford curve is plotted independent of the calculated dates, and yet it passes through five of the six calculated points and through the error bar of the sixth. All sounds good so far, but now things get a little complicated, and here we need to do a little mathematics. This is the Rutherford decay equation. To find the age t requires that the c14 at time zero and the lambda are known. In a nutshell, accurate radiocarbon dating requires that four assumptions be made. The half-life of C14 has to be known, so that decay rate can be accurately determined. The half-life of C14 has to have been the same historically, for the same reason. The sample must not be contaminated. The uptake of C14 during the life of the sample has to be known. Let me start with the half-life. The half-life of C14 has to be known. When Libby started his work, the lambda for C14 its half-life, was not accurately known. His team calculated it at 5,568 years, plus or minus 30 years. The current accepted value is 5,730, plus or minus 40 years. Laboratories have been measuring C14 decay for over 60 years now, and can be confident in this value. The difference from Libby's early calculation is still under 3%. This did cause Libby's original dating to be slightly on the low side, still within the margin for error of his error bars. And of course, all dates could easily be corrected using the original data once the more accurate half-life was known. The half-life of C14 has to have been the same historically. This is quite easy to confirm if you think about it. If the half-life of radioactive materials differed over time, then the decay rates of those materials would differ over time. This would make it impossible to plot consistent graphs for different aged samples. The fact that many thousands of samples from worldwide sites all produce dates which fit the expected curve provides confidence that decay rates have remained constant. It is a fact that there are a couple of technical instances where the half-life of an isotope may change. I'm not going to expand on that here, except to say they do not apply in any way to radiocarbon dating or any radioactive dating technique whatsoever. The sample must not be contaminated. This sounds obvious at first glance, but it is a bit more complicated than that, and creationists love to distort the reality in their efforts to discredit carbon dating. They are quick to point out the anomalies, and just as quick to completely ignore the explanation that is why we must be certain that we have the facts. A sample from the ground might be contaminated by other carbon-based material in situ, e.g. a root growth, or during removal or transport. Scientists, of course, know this and have both special sample preparation protocols and multi-sampling techniques. They can also cross-date samples with others and with tree ring chronologies, lake sediments, ice cores, archaeological records, etc., etc. The Industrial Revolution, when fossil fuels, coal and then oil and gas, began to be burnt in significant quantities, resulted in depleted carbon, i.e. old carbon, where almost all the C14 had been decayed, being returned to the atmosphere in large quantities. Therefore, living organisms have been ingesting proportionately less C14 since the Industrial Revolution began. Scientists know this as well, and radiocarbon dating for this period has been calibrated based on known live tree growth ring chronologies worldwide. The atomic age altered our atmosphere significantly. This is one reason why radiocarbon dates are stated with respect to 1950. Dating shells of sea creatures and coral is prone to error. Sea creatures do not obtain all their carbon directly from the atmosphere. They may obtain some that way, but they also obtain it from the water and anything they ingest. Their carbon-14 profile does not therefore match that of a sample with a completely atmospherically derived carbon content. And of course scientists know this, which is why there is a growing database of samples from around the world allowing more and more accurate calibration of the dating techniques. A handful of creationists will continue to spit out exceptions to the rule, and those with a strong desire to believe will embrace the exceptions and delude themselves into ignoring the fact that it is the exceptions which prove the rule. Meanwhile, many thousands of real scientists will continue to produce hundreds of papers each year on tens of thousands of samples that will continually refine and improve the radiocarbon dating process. 
The result of the various issues detailed above is that radiocarbon dating is more suitable for some samples than others and for differing date ranges among some sample areas. Again, do I really have to say it? Scientists know all of this and offer dates within the limitations of what they know. And of course, they very often have access to corroborative dating techniques from tree rings, ice cores, sedimentation, historical records, etc., etc. We finally come to the last assumption, and here it does get interesting. The uptake of C14 during the life of the sample has to be known. Libby made assumptions during his initial testing that historical atmospheric C14 levels were the same as in the 1940s. Back to our Rutherford equation, and we see that the times zero C14 value, the carbon-14 content of the plant or animal when it died, is key to obtaining a correct date. This could not be directly measured for Libby's first samples. But scientists have 60 years of directly obtained atmospheric C14 sampling data now, and cross-referencing from other dating techniques. But back in the 1940s, Libby assumed for his tests that C14 absorption rates had been the same throughout history. Enter Hans Seuss. Wrong Seuss. Hans Seuss decided to test Libby's assumption that atmospheric carbon-14 levels had not changed over time using tree rings. At that time, Seuss had access to a fully anchored bristlecone pine tree ring chronology of 7,000 years. By carbon dating the samples from the present back to 7,000 years, he could produce a more accurate curve of knowns than Libby had. Seuss was aware that a Dutchman, de Vries, had published work in 1958 and 1959 stating that similar work on European trees had indicated C14 atmospheric values had varied historically. De Vries' involvement in the area diminished somewhat after he committed murder and suicide in that order in 1959. But Seuss published data back to 3,000 years in 1961 and extended it back to 7,000 years in 1969. Seuss confirmed the de Vries effect his data indicated that there were systematic variations in atmospheric C14 content. Over time, many more samples were analysed from around the globe, and these confirmed the wiggles and variations were consistent. And now that these details were known, the value for any period could be plugged into the radiocarbon dating formula to ensure accurate results. The variations in carbon-14 levels in the atmosphere are due to various things. One is the way that carbon cycles through the Earth's system i.e. the amount of it held in the atmosphere, oceans and living matter at any one time. Another is how much C14 is being produced in the atmosphere. This is directly connected to how many cosmic rays are reaching the atmosphere, which in turn is affected by the strength of the Earth's magnetic field and also the Sun's magnetic field, which protects the Earth. Solar activity is marked by sunspots. Sunspots have been recorded for over 2,000 years and recorded sunspot activity agrees with the C14 calibration curve, which agrees with C14 in ice cores. The de Vries effect is of course well known, and radioactive dates are therefore given as X years BP, before present. As stated earlier, BP actually means before 1950. Also, the radiocarbon date given is that based on the uncorrected decay curve for carbon-14. This is not a fudge, fix or fiddle. It is done because the date correction required for a sample is dependent on various factors, including type of sample, location of extraction, etc. When a radiocarbon date is determined, the known calibration can be applied to determine the calendar age of the sample. I hope I've shown in this video how science continues to develop the 60-year-old radiocarbon dating method, how scientists are fully aware, of course, of the pitfalls and limitations of the method, and how the abilities to cross-date with tree ring, sediment and ice core data provides confidence in the dating process. Thank you as always for watching.